It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lasseur and John B. Oakes from the editorial board of the New York Times. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Her Excellency Claire Booth Luce, United States Ambassador to Italy. And President Eisenhower nominated Claire Booth Luce to be Ambassador to Italy two years ago. Some persons doubted the wisdom of his choice. Never before had a woman been named or assigned to a first-class European power, and certainly not to one that was in trouble, where communism was growing. Well, two years have passed, and communism has become weaker. Italy is stronger. Even the Trieste problem has been settled. In short, never underestimate the power of a woman. Madam Ambassador, or Mrs. Ambassador, before we catechize you, I'd like to ask you, just how do you like Italy? Are you enjoying yourself there? Well, Italy is a very wonderful country. I don't, I don't say that because I have the honor to be accredited to it. Uh, the proof of that is that uh, over six million tourists visited Italy last year, <coughs> 500,000 Americans, and they went there to see uh, the beauty of Italy and to uh, also to find that the Italians are the most charming and courteous people in the world. Well, actually, is Italy ready to stand on its own feet now, or do we have to continue aiding her? Well, let's face it, Italy is a relatively poor country. Uh, it will not be able to solve its own problems uh, entirely alone for a good many years. It will need the help of Europeans and others in the world, and especially of America. Yes. Ms. Ambassador, uh, to what do you attribute the diminution of communist influence inside Italy, and how strong is it there still anyway? Well, I attribute uh, such a diminution as there have been largely to the common sense of the Italian people. Uh, they're a very wise people, and they are beginning to see that communism really, uh, really doesn't pay and doesn't produce the things that they expected uh, many of them of it. That is one of the main reasons. Also, the government uh, has taken some very uh, vigorous action against the communists in the last uh, year. You Such know. as? Well, they have uh, dispossessed uh, the communists from the former government-owned fascist properties, communist unions and uh, many communist organizations. They have moved in to clear communists out of sensitive places all through the government. Uh, they've done a good many things of that sort. They're invoking for the first time uh, very strong uh, libel uh, laws against the, um, against the communists for libel in the press. And Mrs. So Lewis, would you say that communism is actually still uh, Italy's biggest problem? Oh, there's no question, but what uh, this encroaching form of totalitarianism is the major political problem. How do you account for the fact that communism seems to have grown in the uh, agricultural areas, more backward areas in Sicily? Well, that's a bit of a paradox, you know. Uh, the government has really done some extraordinary <coughs> work in the question of land reform in the south of Italy, in the depressed areas. Uh, obviously, the government couldn't move forward to solve the whole question overnight, but very often where it has moved in, the communist organizations have moved in faster to take the credit uh, for what the government has done and to demand more than the government uh, can possibly do at this time without, uh, without risking inflation. Would you say that the land reform program really is progressing then in a practical and positive sense? Oh, yes, there's no question of it. I've seen those areas myself. Many, uh, many of our people have visited the land reform areas, <coughs> and the government has done some splendid work. What about the question of taxes? A lot of people in this country think the Italians do not pay and never intend to pay taxes. Do you have any comment to make on that? Well, of course, millions of Italians do pay taxes because otherwise the government could never, never uh, <coughs> find the revenue with which to, uh, to keep its own uh, budget going. 
Uh, perhaps the upper classes don't pay taxes as heavily as we do. Uh, that's true. That's true all through Europe, as you know. I mean, Americans are the heaviest tax-paying people in the world. But also it's a fact uh, that more and more uh, rich Italians, well-to-do Italians, are paying more and more taxes than they've ever uh, paid before. And there's a lot of uh, tax reform going on, too. Mrs. Lewis, how stable is the government of Mario Shelba? What about all those scandals we've been hearing about here? Are they shaking them? Well, there were, of course, the, some very uh, severe scandals. There was the well-known Montese case. Uh, then recently, there's been uh, a, a really startling scandal uh, called the Sochu scandal. It concerned uh, the really um, deplorable conduct, one wouldn't mention it, of course, uh, on the air of a communist called Sochu. I see. And uh, is Sachu still uh, in the Communist Party? Uh, no, he was promptly thrown out of the Communist Party when the scandal was revealed. Uh, oh. Ms. Ambassador, what's the most important factor in American-Italian relations, as you see it after two years over there? Uh, economic aid, our military strength, the refugee program, what are the main Problems. Well, American-Italian relations are fundamentally very sound. There's a long <coughs> history of friendship and understanding between Italy and the United States. I don't think that uh, there's any political power or any situation that I can conceive of uh, that would uh, really damage Italian-American relations badly. Obviously, the Italians do look to us as the world's strongest and richest and most friendly power for aid, and they've received an enormous amount in the past. Would you say American prestige is very high in Italy? Uh, well, Mr. Tarchiani, Ambassador Tarchiani, when he left his post in Washington last month, called at the White House and told President uh, Eisenhower that in all the history of Italy, Italian-American relations had never been better. Due partly to our ambassador in Rome, no doubt. Well, that's kind of you to say so. Do if, if to the ambassador, let's say partly to the embassy. I've got a wonderful team of men over there. You what know. about Trieste? Well, uh, Trieste is a settled question, and the fact one hears so little about it now shows that it was a good solution that has been accepted by both the Italian and the Yugoslav uh, people. It goes to show you, you know, that you can avoid trouble and you can get things solved with patience and a spirit of mutual uh, sacrifice as the Italians and the Yugoslavs uh, showed in this very dangerous and troublesome question. Mr. Luce, uh, <coughs> diplomacy has been a male preserve most part of the time. Now, a lot of women are looking in at you tonight. Do you think there is a career in diplomacy for most women or for... Oh, I think there's a career in diplomacy for all able people who want to try uh, to, uh, to become diplomats, become foreign service officers. It isn't a question of whether they're men or women. It's a question of they're willing to work and if they're able. Well, you actually don't feel that there is a question of whether they're men or women. In other words, you feel that a woman can negotiate, can uh, maneuver with European politicians as well as a man can? Well, you want to know whether a woman can negotiate and maneuver? Yes. <laughs> I do ask <laughs> Mrs. Lasseur about that. <laughs> do you think, uh, Mrs. Ambassador, that the Italians can make a really effective contribution to the Western European Union? And if they can, how? And what well, way? I think they've already made a, a very extraordinary uh, contribution in the last few months. You do remember uh, that uh, they passed Western European Union with a majority of 120 votes. Uh, apart from the pro-common form parties, there wasn't a single vote cast against it uh, in the lower house, in the camera of the Italian Parliament, and I think the Senate will pass it by the same overwhelming majority. There isn't any question where the vast majority of Italian people stand, they stand very firmly on our side. Well, we don't have anything to fear in the, in the next elections, then? 
Mrs. Lewis? Well, no one knows when, at this moment, the next elections will be. They uh, are scheduled for 1958, every five years, as you know. They might <coughs> come before, so till one knows what the situation is at the time when they come, you, you can't predict. Mrs. Lewis, I was just recalling that the first time I met you was in 1940, up in the Maginot Line, when you were gathering uh, material for your book, Europe in the spring. Now, as you go back to Europe this spring, what will you face and find there? Well, certainly a, a Europe that has made an astonishing economic and, I believe, political recovery. But also you'll find in Europe in the spring that they will be very <coughs> concerned about what's going to happen in Asia in the winter. They will be deeply concerned that American arms, American prestige, uh, shall have no setback in the Pacific because uh, a blow to American prestige there would have repercussions on European uh, politics. Do you think that uh, our allies in Europe are really firmly behind us in the event that we should get in trouble in the East? I think there's no question where the majority of Europeans want to stand. They want to stand within the framework of Western European and American civilization. They don't want war. Who does? I don't. I'm sure. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Ambassador. We're very grateful to have you here tonight. The opinions expressed on the Longine Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Larry LeSeur and John B. Oakes. Our distinguished guest was Her Excellency Claire Booth Luce, United States Ambassador to Italy. They say everyone notices the watch on your wrist. To be well dressed, every detail must conform, including your watch. Now Longines makes a watch to fill every need, to suit every taste. And the choice of styles and of models is almost unlimited. For ladies, Longines creates superb examples of the jeweler's art. Exquisite in taste and finish, perfect for every occasion. For men, Longines produces watches for every requirement, watches for dress and sport. Longines automatic watches, the most advanced in the world. Waterproof and shock-resistant watches for rugged service. Longines chronograph watches for sportsmen and scientists. And every Longines watch, whether for a lady or for a gentleman, is made to the unique standards of excellence which have won for Longines 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. And this statement is true throughout the world. The Longines watch on your wrist is just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world, the watch of highest reputation and prestige. Yet, surprisingly, you may own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor watches. At Longines Whitnor Jewelers, see Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by Le Coultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by variations in the temperature of the atmosphere. Atmos, product of Le Coultre, division of Longines Whitnor. Help fight polio, give to the March of Dimes. 